Hi, this is David from the Solid Rock Church in Drogheda, Ireland. Thanks for tuning in. We really hope this conversation inspires you. Let's get stuck in and as always, get in touch with any comments or questions via our socials or our website, solidrock.ie. Hello everyone and welcome. Today I'm sitting down with David and we'll be chatting about coming home and I am super excited today because it is also a Sunday when we introduce a new song to our church that we wrote ourselves and produced ourselves and it's called Coming Home as well. So this is great that we can chat about it and we can also on Sunday sing a song about it. It's um, it's amazing. Let's, let's dive in, David. Yeah, so we know that our theme for this year in the church is home and so coming home, of course, fits with that really well. Mm. And, you know, I... I, let's set the scene a little bit like so before we get into and I guess people who know their scripture can probably guess the scripture that we're going to look at as a part of this message uh, it's the it's the ultimate coming home story in the Bible and that's the parable of the lost son we're going to read about that in Luke 15 in a little mm-hmm. while but before we get into the scripture I just want to set the scene a little bit with what coming home is all about for me personally if I look at this family I love opening the door and stepping inside our home after a busy day because it's a place where we love each other. By by no means are we a perfect family. We're not going to pretend to be. You're not going to, you're going to catch me out if I'm lying. Mm. If I try and pretend we're a perfect family, you'll definitely pull me up on that. For sure. Live in this podcast. So I'm not going to pretend that we're a perfect family, but you know what? We're a family who love each other. We're a family who have their hard times, but we're a family that, love each other and create an atmosphere of not judging, of being Mm. supportive of one another. And so I love coming home to that because I love you guys. And I guess you guys love me as well. Yeah, we love you too. Yeah? Mm. Good to know. Yeah. (laughs) And so it creates this really nice environment. Mm. The the act of coming home is a joyous act. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's... um, you know the saying there's no place like home and uh, to me for example when when we're on way on holidays uh, i love going away i love being away um i love visiting different places but then uh, there's always this point when we're away that i'm like oh you know i wish that i was home now i miss our home like usually i miss i miss my mattress i miss my bed uh, but there's there's always even if you are in a really nice place there's always this time where you when you feel homesick that you want to come back home and uh, that, 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 that idea of coming home to me, it's always associated with this longing actually to be back somewhere where I think I belong. Yeah, and I think that really encompasses the, the, the kind of core or the heart of, of this topic. You know, when we, when we talk about what it is to come home in terms of us coming to Christ or coming to finding our place within the church, mm. I think that really encompasses it. And I th- but I think it's also important that we recognize right at the offset that actually when when families and households are going through problems then then that it's very easy for that joy of returning home to be lacking Mm. because if you're if you're in the middle of a hard situation in your in your relationships at home then returning home is just is 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 continually returning to friction and and Mm. and and fighting and and disagreement and lack of support and stuff so i just want to kind of make that make make that statement as well that I'm aware that for many people in going through difficulty at the moment this this idea of coming home does not represent one that is filled with love mm. and support and joy but even in that even when somebody can't really draw the parallels between them returning to their physical home mm. it's 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 recognizing from scripture that we're going to look at how our return story or our coming to Christ and in a sense returning home and finding home is one that is uh, an incredible one. Mm. It's one that gives us a different outcome than what maybe we would expect Mm. when we return home from being away Mm. Mm. and how welcoming God is towards us. So it's worth it's worth getting stuck into the scripture. I want to read out quite a large chunk of scripture and bear with me. I think it's worth going through all of it because we're going to draw some points out of it and we need to really grasp the story well to be able to do that. So I'm going to read a chunk of scripture 
in Luke 15, verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the young son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, if there's any young ears listening to this podcast, I just want to stipulate that while living for those younger ears, uh, essentially is saying that he didn't finish all his dinner, but he still had an ice cream and maybe ate too much ice cream and really indulged in too many sweets. So Mm -hmm. just want to make that point as we go through. Um, So while living, after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. And I think there's a good economic lesson for everyone there. Don't squander your wealth, even if you have it, because when famine and hard times come, or in our case, recessions, um, you'll have nothing stored up. So Mm. it's a good tip to invest, to learn from this youngest son who did not do that. Um, so he, he just kind of blew it. He blew it and lived large. And then when hard times hit, he was stranded. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And verse 17 says, when he came to his senses. Now, I find that incredible from a timeline perspective that it took him time in this desperate situation, knowing that he came from a family of affluence and wealth. And I don't know whether it was pride or stubbornness or him not wanting to face mm. going home ashamed that he squandered all his wealth. But he he basically was hungry, feeding pigs and hungry. And it took him time mm. to come to his senses and decide to return home, Mm -hmm. which I think is crazy. That happens to be the reality, I think, for a lot of people who are stepped away from God, Mm. that we live with our own own consequence of destruction, Mm. and we refuse to go to God with it. We refuse to take what we are, our failed state, to God, and it takes us time because we're kind of wanting to keep living in what is not working. Our, the chaos of our own outworking. Mm. And we just would choose that over just coming back to God and going, hey, my way didn't work. What have you got? Mm. I think that's incredible. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Uh, Adam certainly could back in the Garden of Eden when he tried to hide from God mm. when he wasn't doing something right. Um. But anyway, we read on, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and I'll say to him, and it's crazy because he has this moment where he's kind of thinking ahead, what's the conversation going to be like? He's yeah. playing it out in his head. Yeah, I think most people have always this inner dialogue or inner monologue actually in their heads and uh, planning out of what to say in this pinnacle moment of their lives. Yeah, it's like being anxious towards that conversation. I'm going to have to Mm. face my father who gave me half, he gave me all my inheritance. He gave me half of his wealth. Mm. I blew it. I now want to go back. So I'm going back crawling and he's playing out how this conversation is going to work, you know? So he's like saying, "I'll, I'll say to my father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he's willing to give up his sonship. And instead he's saying, make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still, A long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. I think that's an incredible Mm. moment. Um, I wonder how the father recognized the son from a distance. Like maybe he recognized him by his walk. Mm. Or maybe he just was every day he was hoping for that moment that his son would return and so then when he sees someone walking from afar he just jumps at the conclusion Mm. this has got to be my son because every day he was in anticipation of this Mm. i think could be both because i think if you know somebody so well um you do recognize that everyone has a very specific way uh, of walking you know so uh, probably he saw him from far away and he was like wow uh, he's here let's 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 run up to him and i think it's worth 
at this point also stopping and going, you know what? The father didn't respond the way the son thought he would. Mm. Instead of being disappointed that he came back with nothing, the father embraces him. And he says to him, the son delivers his pre-planned line. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to call your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fin- finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, and this is the kind of side point of, of, of family dynamic going on. Meanwhile, the old, older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Wow. I actually, uh, when we were just reading it now, I realized that they started celebrating before the son was informed, the, the other son was informed that uh, his brother came home. Maybe that's why he was a little bit uh, angry. You know? He felt put to the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess the first point that I really want to draw out of that story, and there's three. The first one is that even when the younger son's existence was dismal, it took him time to accept that doing things his way was not working for him. So it, the scripture says when he came to his senses, you know, and I I just I just think it's a, there's a lesson in that for all of us, that we don't dwell in our despair. Mm leaving God out of the picture, mm. but that we recognize early into our failure or we we come to a point quicker where we recognize that we need God mm. and we come to him as, yep. a, as a loving father. Yeah, but isn't it, isn't it interesting that we are so good at living with our baggage, even though we know that God wants to bring us into a better existence? Yeah, I think the human condition, I think we're continually fighting pride and i think it takes humility and repentance i don't think we can reach a place of repentance without humility Mm. and if we lack humility which leads us to lacking the ability to ask for forgiveness or to recognize our shortfalls and bring that to god then we end up in a situation often where we are just living in hunger, feeding pigs, mm. and we know there's an inheritance. We, you know, last couple of, couple of weeks ago, we talked about inheritance. We know there's an inheritance for us, which is so much better than what we're currently living in, but we're not willing to humble ourselves to step into that. We'd rather just keep trudging along in our own desperate muck. Mm. I think that's just incredible when you word it like that, as you said, with our own baggage. We'd rather live with our mess mm. than to go, do you know what? I, I can give this up if I'm just willing to return. Hmm. And so we there's people that find themselves needing to come back to God. Mm-hmm. But I also think there's a part where, as people who are living with God, still have application through the story, mm-hmm. where it's not only about the lost son that came back. There's a There's a part in each one of us that is still lost and needs to come back even if you're in church, even if you know God, that we're often very good at compartmentalizing and keeping certain bits away from God. You know, I think sticking with the home theme, I think of the fact that every home probably has a messy drawer mm. or a messy room, the room that guests are not allowed into. Do we have one of those? <laughs> I won't say it publicly, no. 
Do we? Are you going to admit to the fact that we at least have a messy drawer? We do have a messy drawer. Yes. Probably like four messy drawers. Yes. yes. But uh, recently you moved your stuff from the messy drawer, and now it's your own messy drawer, no, which no, is super orderly. No, 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 <laughs> no. So let me clarify. I got sick of our messy drawer, <laughs> and so I moved my stuff into a new drawer, which is an organized David-only drawer. Although Hannah put her wall in there. <laughs> she likes your orderly drawer. <laughs> And so I don't want to be a part of the mess. I created my own mm. neat drawer, mm. which was birthed out of the messy drawer. Okay, then. But there's something always good coming out of mess, you see? Well, so th- we, we, all, we, all, you know, we all have a messy drawer in our lives. Like, no Christian lives a life where there isn't at least a messy drawer. Some of us have maybe a messy room. Some of us might just have a messy house. But even if we just have a small messy drawer that we all the stuff that we can't place we just bung it into that drawer of our lives where we don't know what to do with it but it just lives there mm-hmm. and it might be very insignificant but it's still a part that i believe god really wants access to mm. but you know the, the thing about messy drawer is uh, that you don't pay attention how messy that is you know uh, we can very easily add and add and add and add onto the mess that is already there and only when someone from the outside looks in they're like oh that that's very messy or whatever and i think it's the same with our lives there's things in our lives that we are so used to having that we don't see that they are out of place or misplaced so what you're saying effectively it sometimes takes friends and community to help us identify stuff that we might be keeping to ourselves when actually we should be giving it up to christ i think we should be open to uh, a very loving uh, relationship where people can point that things to us. Yeah, for sure. That's how we can grow. Yeah, I, th- I agree with that. First point being, don't hold back, run to God. Bring everything to him. Hmm. The second point I think that's worth picking out from the story is the father's rejoicing on the son's return. So this lost son came home and what he did in his time away was not overly healthy or productive it wasn't at all healthy or productive and the father doesn't respond with hey why did you do that he didn't respond with judgment the father and we know god to be like that will always respond to us returning home Mm. with love whether that means the child who's been gone or whether it's us bringing that compartment of junk Mm to him he will always embrace us and rejoice Mm. and celebrate and it will add joy to his heart Mm. to see us bring that to him i always see that picture of uh, jesus standing there with his arms wide open and he's literally waiting for us to make that return home so he can embrace us um i find that always very uh beautiful yeah and i think it's also an encouragement if you've been praying for family members to to find Christ, don't give up on those people. Mm. Keep praying for them. It's such an incredible event to celebrate when God's children come home. Mm. And Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And mm. that's what we can all apply into our lives. Mm. Why would we why would we stop ourselves from giving everything to the God who rejoices when mm. we come to him? Yeah. And you know like sometimes when we have Sundays where we where people uh, do accept Jesus or or they return home or for whatever reason they they respond to uh, to a calling, I I always feel very moved by it, very I always rejoice, but I feel very moved and that only shows me wow if i feel that way how much more god feels about us coming home and making that return home and um i'm I'm pretty sure the whole you know the whole heaven is rejoicing when one sinner um returns home Uh, and it's 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 amazing actually that we can experience a little bit of that in our church settings as well when we see when people respond to, to 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 the gospel yeah it's amazing it's amazing i love seeing that as well I guess the third thing that I think is worth focusing on in the context of the scripture is asking the question, why was the older son angry? 
you know, the father tries to bring him around and tries to explain that, look, you know, you're here and everything is yours, but it's worth rejoicing when somebody who was lost is found. And when I think of the motivation that could have caused the younger son to be angry, I think that maybe he was angry because he didn't have the same heart as the father. The, the, the older son saw it as competition. Hmm compared what he didn't get in the past and what the younger son is now getting to celebrate his return. Maybe it's because it wasn't his son. You know, it was his brother. There's different uh, different relationship there. Different dynamic at mm. play, for sure. For sure. And I guess you, you'd never expect the brother to, to have the same relationship as one of a father and a son. Mm. But I still think we can learn from that because I think... I think we are called as believers to have the same heart as God. So, yeah, you know, our brothers and sisters in Christ are not our sons and daughters the way we are to God. But as we reflect the heart of God, I think that pushes to the side things like jealousy and bitterness mm. and comparing. I guess like one of the things that really aggravates me about our kids is that they constantly, if, you know, if one takes two biscuits, the other one needs two biscuits because it's got to be fair. It's got to be fair. And, and and I always just say to them, like, what does it matter? What does it matter? If you only feel like having one biscuit, have one biscuit and don't begrudge the second biscuit to your sibling. Like, what difference does it make mm. if there's equality there or not in those little things? And we're, we're like that as Christians. I mean, we, we kind of just, we're, there's so much bitterness and jealousy and comparing each other to others. And he got more than me or I'm kind of, you know, I'm hard done by in comparison to them and stops us from being thankful for the, what we have because mm. there's always somebody around the corner who has more and mm. it becomes this horrible race and we're not competing against each other mm. we're we're all children of god and god has bestowed on us what we don't deserve mm. we don't deserve the fullness of life that god has opened up for us and instead of being thankful for that every day instead we're like jealous of our brothers and sisters in Christ who return and have a celebration mm. and we're like instead of celebrating with God over this incredible thing we're we're sometimes finding ourselves stuck in this corner like the older son going why not me you know mm. Mm. which is missing the point entirely it's missing this kingdom point entirely and I think that the, the way we combat that is to really grasp the heart of God mm. I'm just reminded of this uh, picture I saw somewhere, uh, probably on Facebook, you know, there's um, marathon runners. And obviously when they are running a marathon on this uh, professional level, they're competing against each other, right? So they, they want to run faster than the other. But there's this beautiful picture um, and one of the runners uh, kind of, I don't know, he fainted or he, he was very weak just before they crossed the finish line. And the one who was actually winning sacrificed his place in the race to help that one uh, he kind of carried him through the finish line and to me what it showed there was the switch between we are competing against each other to uh, I'm here actually to help you to to carry you through it to cheer you on and I think in in our hearts we, we sometimes also need to we, we need to make that switch you know from uh, competing uh, as brothers and sisters to hey Let's 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 help each other out. Let's let's carry each other out, even if it costs us this being first to cross the finish line. Yeah, and we know that scripture talks about comparing our life to being in a race, but at no point does it say that we're racing against each other. Mm. So we need to we need to take that on board for sure. Mm. So coming back, wrapping up, and coming back to to something that I touched on earlier. Even though it's easy for us to read the story in the context of those that are lost and far from God that need to return. And I think that message is clearly there. I think it's a twofold message. I think it's also for those who are living for God or God is dwelling in us, but we still maybe have that prodigal drawer or compartment in our lives that needs bringing to God. And, and, and it's recognizing that, you know, God wants all of us. He doesn't want most of us and we will be so much more fulfilled if we let God into those little areas that might be a bit chaotic and we're trying to hide from everybody else and really bring those back mm. and go, and kind of go, just hands up in humility go God you know what 
um, this is an area where I know I've not made you God over my life. Mm. And it's time for that to also return to you. And I believe that God can do an incredible thing in people's lives if we wholly surrender who we are to him. Mm. And I believe he, he one, he's going to make us much more content and driven by purpose and conviction. But two, he's going to be able to use us so much more powerfully into the things that he would have for us and into being able to be a positive change in this world. Um, so the, I think that that's what I want to draw out of this story as well as the parallel for those who maybe are far from God and really need to return to mm. him as, as, as their father and creator. And then also the third point being that if you have always lived with God or you're living with God to not see people who return to God as being people that we need to compete against but instead to 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 get that to get that heart of God in those situations that we're able to love them the way God loves them mm. let's not present ourselves as a barrier to people returning to Christ mm. there are no conditions to people returning to Christ other than our own lack of humility. There's no barriers that God puts up. He just wants people to come back to him and he's ready to rejoice over that. And so sometimes we just put a lot of walls in place that are walls built on things like insecurities and resentment and jealousy and bitterness. And those walls, there's no place there. They, they need to be they need to be knocked down so that we just make a clear path for people mm. and I, I guess I want to end with this I think I think it would be great to be brothers and sisters who when they see their lost sibling coming back from afar that we would run out to greet them and that we would run back to the house with them mm. show them in give them a new key if the lock's been changed and be a part of their solution to returning to Christ rather than a hindrance. Hey, I really hope you found this sit down helpful. We pray it has an impact on your future and stirs your faith. If you want to know more about who we are as a church, best place to start is via our website, solidrock.ie. If you feel this podcast has helped you in your journey and you want to sow financially into the life of the church, you can do that by going directly to our giving page, solidrock.ie forward slash giving, and in a few simple taps, you can give directly to the life of the church. Until next time, stay selfless, love God, and serve others.